A huge benefit of the fact that Swift enums are not secretly ints is we can associate more values with each case. We've added a user ID integer to the second case, maybe a token to the two-factor case. Let's name them so we know what they are. Often, enum cases are used to represent different states. Rarely is simply knowing which state we're in good enough. Usually there is some additional information associated with each state. Here, when we succeed at login, we receive a machine-readable unique ID for the user. When we need to wait on a two-factor auth code, we also need a secret token to send back along with that code. Maybe there's some error information associated with the failure case? We'll talk more about Swift errors in a later week. To create one of the cases with an associated value, we can't just use the name anymore. We need to provide the associated value. The associated values are not exposed as properties. After all, a property is available to the compiler whether the enum is in a certain case or not. Instead, we use a let in the switch case to extract the value. Similar to a guard let or if let, we're using a case let to extract the associated values with each case. Notice also that I'm using an underscore to ignore the associated value of the two-factor case. It is possible to write more than one associated value for an enum. However, once you get started, the list can get quite long. I recommend that instead we wrap up these values together in their own struct. This may make it unnecessary to use a label because we'll know from the special type why the information is present. In addition, it's likely that this information needs to go together in another context. Here's an oversimplified version of the UI that we'd need for accepting a two-factor auth code. In the context of a controller whose job is only to work on a two-factor auth code, having a generic login result to store the values associated with a two-factor auth situation doesn't make sense because it could also represent success and fail cases. So wrapping my logged in user credentials into their own type in a single associated value in the enum works better in both places. Just as if and guard allowed additional bool expressions in a single conditional, switch supports making multiple tests on an extracted associated value. Suppose we have two kinds of users, regular users and admins, and we want to handle admin users differently. We've encapsulated the account properties into their own type, logged in user. Next, the dot succeed case gets an instance of that type as its lone associated value. Notice that we've used a where statement to introduce the Boolean expression. We can't just separate user is admin from let user with a comma, since in this context a comma would mean an independent case. Switch is actually capable of executing any expression which resolves to a bool, and tests ranges, and performs comparisons. Unfortunately, we don't have time to cover that in this course, so I'll just refer you back to the Swift ebook. You may have noticed that when I added associated values, I removed the int or string inheritance. That's because I can't initialize arbitrary associated values with a simple int or string. Instead, if we want a failable initializer, we'll need to write one ourselves. In the process, we'll learn how to write failable initializers for structs and classes as well. Suppose I'm initializing a login result with some JSON that came back from the server. We'll talk about JSON deserialization another day. For now, we'll just assume that our JSON is represented by a dictionary. We'll declare a failable initializer for the login result. Just like an initializer for a struct or a class, we start with init, we have arguments within parentheses. We also add a question mark to indicate that this initializer may return nil. Next, we add code to determine which state the JSON dictionary represents. When you read the sample, Pay less attention to how we extracted the values from the dictionary, and more attention to how we initialized self with those values. Specifically, we call self equals and then provide a specific case to succeed at initialization. To fail at creating a login result, which is different from succeeding in creating a login result to represent failure of login, we call return nil. Notice that we don't write self equals nil, nor do we write return dot fail. For structs and classes, we can set the properties directly in the failable initializer. Here, I've created a struct to represent the number on a card in a deck of cards. Since only values 0 through 12 are valid, I've caused the init to fail if the value is not valid. Notice that my initializer sets the properties like a regular init method, self.int equals. 
Yes, I could have named that property raw value, but it's so long. Also, I made the properties let so that other code can't set it to an out-of-range value. This makes even more sense when combined with the other pieces of code, card suit and card. I could have represented a card's index with a plain int, but that would allow out-of-range values. By wrapping the index into its own type, I've introduced a layer of safety. Card index is not just an alias for an int. It can only be initialized with acceptable values. However, since it's a struct, it dispatches statically, which means accessing the index is very fast. With no inheritance or memory management to worry about, the struct doesn't take up much more room than just the int. I'm essentially getting the performance of using an int with the safety of using a compiler-enforced type. Today we learned how to associate values with specific cases in an enum. We also learned how to write our own custom failable initializers. Enums with type-save associated values. Now that's swift.